Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be here at WIDER. And I'd like to thank Finn Tarp and the university for inviting me. I first got to know Finn in, in Mozambique. And it's great to be here, but a bit daunting when you have your professor, that you're, uh, <coughs> your ex-professor that you're giving comments on. So Dr. Abbott, I hope you forgive me if I refer to you as Phil, uh, because I've been calling Pear Pear for years. And of course, Usman is my colleague and counterpart in, in another work. So I want to just briefly review the key points that were discussed, but put some ideas on the table for the discussion that you're going to be having. Both Phil and uh, Pear drew on research work done in association with Uni Wider to take a deep dive look into the recent past, drawing on data but seeking also to understand the political economy, understanding what and how decisions are made. Um, for uh, Phil, the lens was focused on foreign direct assistance, both from the public sector as well as private investment. And as Pear just explained to you, he focused on a study that looked at 14 countries that dealt with the increase in international food price fluctuations triggered by the food price crisis in key grain crops in 2007-2008. Uh, Usman focused on looking at the structural change in Africa in the 1990s and the decline in agriculture in the 1990s led to the massive exodus to the low-paying formal goods and service sector. I'd like to hit on a few key points uh, for discussion, um, starting with Pear's paper. Pear's main point is that we need to move beyond numbers and understand what drives political choices if we are going to be able to recommend actions that are truly relevant for sustaining healthy diets for all. And he gave some of the underlying reasons. I think the one that rang home with me uh, most closely as having worked in a policy advisor for the, in the uh, Ministry of Agriculture for many years was the fact that there are several players involved in making these decisions and governments obviously prioritize protecting their own legitimacy. And I often remember that the only time our beautiful research papers and policy briefs got used is when they agreed with what the Minister of Agriculture wanted to do already. So I understand the win-win principle when you're thinking about what you can actually get done and move forward with with governments. And it really struck me from looking at the, the last chapter in his book that one thir only one third on average of the world market food price changes were transmitted uh, to these developing countries. And really what's really driving the large impact are the national fa factors um, such as extreme weather events, poorly functional domestic markets, and limited international food trade in most developing countries. And he gave some clear recommendations on the way forward, speci specifically emphasizing uh, targeted compensation over price interventions, and he also mentioned improving management of cereal stocks. And I think this is all very insightful analysis. Um, and we are truly interested, I think though, if we're truly interested in healthy diets for all, uh, we should be looking beyond the top three grains in world trade. And I think, for instance, we should be concerned that we have not seen productivity increases in the vegetables, pulses, and legumes at the same rate as grain crops over the past three decades. And consequently, the prices of vegetables, fruits, and legumes relative to grains increased uh, more, making it harder for poor people to afford healthy, diversified diets. And as Per noted when he was speaking, shouldn't we be paying more attention to the micronutrient content per hectare uh, as we move forward? And of course, uh, those of us working in biofortification that are seeking to put increased micronutrient content in staple food crops uh, recognize the potential for helping to do and contribute to this. We should also be particularly concerned in Sub-Saharan Africa the, that uh, we, the continent produces a limited amount of wheat and many consumers, urban consumers in particular, are hooked on wheat. In 2016, Africa imported 43 million tons of wheat, costing $9.3 billion. And uh, over the last decade as a whole, Sub-Saharan Africa has been a major a driver of rising global wheat trade due to rising demand by urbanization, population growth, and the increasing middle class. 
So should there not be more active policy efforts to encourage more consumption of foods that can be grown on the African context and really promote policies for partial wheat flour substitution by crops grown on the continent? Abbott stressed that feeding 9 billion people will require substantially increased production. And he noted that what food, uh, really foreign assistance can contribute is very small compared to what is needed. Um, but in partial answer to Philip's question, should we invest only when there is good governments? I would say the answer is no, because governments can change and should ordinary people really be punished for governance uh, that they are not necessarily fully responsible for at the time. The question is, for the panel, what type of investment should you make for different kinds of regimes uh, so you can make progress, in, especially in creating the infrastructure investments and the educational investments so that emerging leaders will help get the needed change? Moreover, I would ask the panel, what are the dangers which occur when foreign aid and FDI focuses just on a few countries felt worthy of investment? What is truly the capacity of governments to absorb and utilize uh, well, large amounts of funds in short periods of time. Uh, Phil also noted that the expansion of the private uh, public sector partnerships has not taken off for agriculture as hoped for. But I think, uh, and in part this is because, as he noted, due, due to the unstable political environments, tax regimes, or the inadequate infrastructure and profit margins due to low purchasing powers of many consumers. I would note that some of the same investments that enable agriculture uh, will also enable more private sector investment. But as Badian noticed, the one area we are seeing more outside private foreign investment as well as internal domestic investment is the food industry. And we've seen positive and negatives, again, for human health in that regard. Nutritionists are already noting that most African countries are experiencing the triple burden of malnutrition that is high rates of undernutrition, high rates of hidden hunger or micronutrient malnutrition, and rising levels of obesity, particularly in urban areas. And I always uh, look at the story of instant noodles in Nigeria as my key example of that. The company Indomie entered Nigeria with imported instant noodles from Indonesia in 1988. They now have 10 factories and there are 17 other countries producing instant noodles in Nigeria. And Nigeria is now the 12th largest consumer of instant noodles in the world. Now, if you read the business literature, this is considered a great success. But from the nutrition standpoint, it's a disaster. Low on nutritive content, high on calories, fat, sodium, and low dietary fiber. So, and to top it off, they market this as tasty nutrition, good for you. The only noodles brand endorsed by the Nutrition Society of Nigeria. So let us note that the WHO estimated that in 2014, 25 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa are already living with diabetes, up from 4 million in 1980, with an estimated two-thirds of the cases undiagnosed. So the question I pose, is it time to move beyond just food prices and concurrently include food quality in most of our work? Can the developing world really afford or want to adopt the efficient but unhealthy food system of the West? Is there an international responsibility for foreign assistance to strengthen regulatory bodies and institutions to think through future options and go for an efficient but healthy one? Is the move of many countries providing foreign direct assistance in the past from tr trade, not aid, going to positively or negatively affect the kind of food system being promoted. Uh, Badian did an excellent job of presenting his concept of structural change, um, and he demonstrated what happened in the 90s, uh, the negative 90s, I always call them, in terms of agriculture, in comparison to the time since 2000. And he showed figures that the rate of GDP growth was even higher uh, in Africa than for BRICS or the world average, but I suspect that some of that is driven by Africa having a lot, much lower base to start with. Um, but a strong in, uh, argument is made that the situation is turning around and there's been overall positive structural change. Um, and, but again, I, and I really appreciate the Millet example of how to build value chains to address the needs of urban consumers who want convenient food products. 
Again, I would hope you would use, uh, encourage them to be growing iron biofortified millet in that regard. But, um, and he enumerated the investment in skills and trainings that will be needed to do this. Alongside this investment, is it important to get um, laboratory investments and investments uh, in facilities that can let us work on nutrient retention and food quality as we go to develop these convenient products? We know urban consumers want convenience, but we also want to make sure that we haven't removed all the micronutrients and minerals during our processing procedures. So I think that has to move hand in hand along with food safety is that we really look at the nutrient quality of what we're doing. She's looking at me, I'm almost done. So for the panelists, we know that climate change is going to result in more frequent extreme events. In this context, what should governments be investing in as the top three priorities to stabilize pl price fluctuations over time within most African countries? What is the correct balance between domestic production and reliance on import for key staples? Um, is it just comparative advantage or should we move beyond that? How do we get policymakers to think beyond calories for keeping the masses quiet to building healthy, diverse food systems to ensure productive, smart populations for the future? Should international organizations help monitor the action of multinational companies investing in fast foods across the globe? Should foreign aid focus on investing in agricultural research since governments are preoccupied with shorter term investments to ensure their own political futures? And finally, perhaps next year, the session can be entitled Hunger and Nutrition Security. Thank you.